This graphic sequence represents a landmark piece of television. Never before has the subject of a World War II documentary been rendered so vividly, placing viewers at the heart of the greatest reign of all. A careful search through the film archives showed that there was no contemporary footage of the mission. So how did Jeremy Clarkson and his producers illustrate the enormous HMS Campbelltown smashing into the epic dock here at Saint Nazaire? Well, they did it in miniature. They literally brought a little bit of Hollywood to the small screen, enlisting the help of cinema's preeminent model makers. This behind the scenes look will reveal how they built, filmed, and edited the real life mission that sounds like a blockbuster movie. Jeremy found the story of uh, the San Nazar raid. Um, he literally did come across it in a book. He rang me really excitedly and he said, no one's ever heard of it. And I was like, well, probably a few have, but he was right in terms of there was a damn good story there, ripe for the telling. Amazingly, it is a, a true, genuine Mission Impossible. Fill a boat with explosives, a really crappy, rubbishy old boat, get it past all those Germans, don't get it grounded, smash into those docks, five tons of explosives, go, and then they can't get home again. I mean, there's every... It's a screenplay writer's template for a war movie. It's the Dirty Dozen. But just filming at present-day Saint Nazaire wasn't going to be enough to do the story justice. It was crucial that the explosive climax of the raid was somehow brought to life. The classic one that directors always say is, what we'll do is come up with something special and we'll let the public use their own imagination and fill in the blanks themselves. What that means is we've run out of money and we're going to fade to black. And I don't think we can do that anymore. So they went to CineSight, a visual effects company used to working with Tim Burton and Jerry Bruckheimer on films ranging from Harry Potter to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and V for Vendetta, where their Houses of Parliament model was indistinguishable from the real thing. go in and you say, right, now, what we'd like to do is... This. And then, obviously, like all TV people on the scrounge, you ask for more, you know. We'd like to show the ship like this and then like this and then we'd like to see it going up there and then maybe half an hour of that. And then we'd like an explosion and maybe some satellites and Paris could be in the background maybe and then maybe 4,000. And they're like, yeah, right, and we've got nine pounds. The decision to do it wasn't based on... It wasn't a financial decision or, you know, it was just really the, the subject matter seemed to uh, strike a chord with everybody. I think it's just, just so interesting that we keep these things in the public's mind of these, you know, such brave guys, you know, much younger than me, who, who went off and, and did these acts and uh, didn't even know if they were going to come back. And, uh, you know, I just think it's a, it's a good timely reminder that we do these things and, you know, it's f for a visual effect company equally. It's exciting stuff to do. I mean, it really is. I mean, it's not, you know, your Harry Potters are lovely and, you know, we, we really enjoy doing those, but, you know, this is a bit action managed. The project was underway, and while Jeremy was dispatched to France, construction of the miniatures and landscapes hurriedly began. They had just 12 weeks to complete not one, but two sets of models. For close up shots, a large ship would be needed. For wider shots, a smaller scale would be necessary. We got hold of a, a model from the States, um, about $300 worth of model, which unfortunately wasn't particularly impressive. In fact, the model arrived two weeks late, and it was immediately obvious the detail was nowhere near convincing enough. What they thought was a useful shortcut wasn't even symmetrical. Valuable days had been wasted, and now everything would have to be built from scratch. That's no mean feat. You simply can't go and knock on the Royal Navy's door and ask for a set of blueprints. 
The team was forced to work largely from just a few key photographs, but were adamant that the replicas of the Campbelltown and its supporting convoy had to be exact. This is a documentary, so if, if we don't get the thing accurate, then really we, we haven't done our jobs. We've got photos of most of the boat, but there's bits we're missing and we have to sort of make assumptions, but really we'll, we'll go to town and get it, get it as close to the original as possible. Judging measurements for the models was a painstaking task, and often they'd have to estimate heights and widths by using people in the photographs as a yardstick. The biggest struggle, really, I had was trying to find out what all the shapes were in the picture. It's, it, you can see a blob, but to actually make that blob and make it look like something, that was quite difficult. I mean, these are going to be seen in the dark from a bit of a distance. You're not really going to see an awful lot of detail, but what you do see to get the lines right and the shadows right, you've got to build it right. So it, it's quite important to get as fine detail as you can possibly into these things, which then means a lot of time building and quite a lot of money. With most of the money being spent on models, out on location, the crew had to make do without the luxury of an official translator. Il arrive à le, le old, le vieux mall. Oui. Oui. Campbelltown, avant port. OK? Full speed. Merde. Wrong. À droite. OK. Et puis à gauche. That will be fine. With three weeks left to go, do the model makers think that everything's going according to plan? Yeah, I do. I do. Ish. We're on schedule enough for, to not lose sleep about it. So that's what I'm sticking to anyway. The huge amount of background buildings were beginning to take shape. We're casting up all the chimneys and some dormer windows and ridges and things like that as we go along. So to do that, it doesn't actually take that long, but there are just so many of them to do, you know? While major landmarks like the pump house had been beautifully crafted in both scales and were looking remarkably like the real thing. But for ultimate realism, it's not sufficient to just have a set of perfectly measured replicas. The materials used also play a crucial part. For example, the best material to use for the hull is pewter. The thing with the pewter is you don't get a totally smooth finish. And in, <laughs> in this particular case, we don't want a smooth finish. This is an old vessel. She's had a long life, 30 odd years, which is quite a way for a destroyer. So you don't want a pristine factory finish on a ship like this. She was chosen because she was you know, near the end of her life, expendable, and uh, want that to reflect in the, the decking and the side panels and everything. But it's not just for aesthetic reasons that pewter works so well. I used ideally for this kind of job because it's very soft, not too heavy, and behaves very much like scaled down steel wood. And it's, um, it doesn't corrode, which in this particular case is rather useful. Um, and also, it will be, when we blow this thing up, you will get the sort of bending and shard creating effects that you get with real metal, you know, this sort of thing. Creating the millions of rivets on the hull looks like a time-consuming task, but there's a rather neat trick of the trade that sped the whole process up. Basically, the pewter's put down on a soft surface, and you have a roller like this, which has different sort of teeth on, it's a cog, and basically you just press and run. And there you go, a line of rivets. Quick, easy, and uh, pretty realistic, especially when it's painted. But before the painters could arrive, they needed one final push to complete construction. The build on this, I'd say, is running at um, approximately 50 man weeks. As far as I know, it's quite unprecedented for, for TV, but um, so here it's, you know, it's what we do. After a lot of midnight oil, the 24 foot long Campbelltown was in good shape. The painting is an art in itself. It's not the paint you put on, but the paint you take off that counts. Everything is sprayed down with water to blend the colours and give it the salty, weathered look. Rust is added with thought, trying to show where ropes would have rubbed or water would have run down from a joint. 
Handrails are made shiny and the middle of steps made to look worn. Working from photographs to try and get the details correct, everything is made to look as realistic as possible. Similarly, the dock walls are given the spritzer treatment, making them look like they've endured the ravages of the sea. Saint-Nazaire is an exposed bit of coast. Just ask the director. Luckily, Jeremy was on hand to offer moral support. With the model unit ever more committed to the project, everyone started staying late to crank up the level of detail. Brass was milled with millimetric precision to create lifelike railings. String can be made to look like rope on some occasions, but just doesn't sag realistically enough, so a special form of bungee is used instead. I'm convinced we got more than we paid for with that. There are men doing a bit more after work. There are men saying, let's make that thing look good, you know? Which is right and proper, because those guys went off in 42, they weren't going to come back. It was a suicide mission. I'd rather be doing what we're doing than what they went through <laughs> on their one, to be honest with you. But yeah, it's, uh, um, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of fitting. Pictures of the astonishing details were sent to Jeremy and he was amazed. Because that's the Campbelltown before they altered it. And the Campbelltown, when they was made disguised as a German ship, had they removed one funnel and tilted the other two back so it looked German. It's a lot more detailed than I thought it was going to be. Oh, beautiful. But we are going to have to get small children to run around on the deck to give it the scale in German uniform. And so, after six frenzied weeks in the workshop, the crew moved to the shooting stage at Bray Studios. While the lights and film cameras were rigged, last-minute finishing touches were added to the models. The thing they built, this Campbelltown, 20-odd feet long, probably cost as much as the real bloody Campbelltown, you know? And it is awesome, it's impressive, it's a fantastic thing. You are doing the most realistic thing with a TV budget that you can do. Against all the odds, they'd made a masterpiece. It would have taken too long and too much money to create a computer-generated Campbelltown that could stand such close-up scrutiny. Every texture was perfect. I'm very, very pleased with it. Um, I mean, you consider how, how short a build time the chaps have had. They've done all of this in six weeks with a very small crew. You know, not just this, but the environment that's in scale with it. They've, everybody's worked very hard on this. Original discussions revealed 25 shots would be needed. The rough sketches of the first storyboard had now been turned into graphical representations, so the whole crew could visualise what the model had to do. A larger model could have actually been put to sea for ultra-realistic filming, but the 13th scale Campbelltown had to be filmed inside a bespoke 60-foot water tank. We've just added... Um some emulsion stainers into it, just to give it that um, you know, sort of estuary dock feel, sort of dirty, dirty, muddy water, rather than a, a sort of bluey Mediterranean feel to it. The reason models look rubbish in like Thunderbirds and stuff like that is the scale. There's a certain size of length of water where a wave, you know, if the boat's that big, the waves around it will look like the ones in your bath, and you can just tell the, the surface tension on the water is evident. So, um, what was that other one? Voice at the Bottom of the Sea, or any of those other ones. I mean, they were fantastic in their day, but you know it's like a little thing going boom, and then and everyone's like six feet around it and everything. Luckily, there were a variety of high-tech methods on hand to try and create the right-sized waves. Huh? Can I have that dustbin? 
short, fast one, so it keep the waves nice and small. Uh, me, I'm a wave maker now. So there's my wave stick, ready to go. <laughs> Scale, waves. Scale waves, yeah, keep them nice and small. Maybe not too many bubbles, but we're, we're so far back, over the bubbles would have popped by the time they get down there. So, yeah. Tracks were laid on the floor, so a camera and the model could be pushed on a consistent line. And some finishing touches were made to the landscapes. It is genuine seaweed, picked, hand-picked yesterday. With the set built, the elaborate task of lighting could begin. Practically the most important part of the whole operation. If you light a model badly, you can almost kill it. So there's certain things that we try and do to, to help the model. And there's a tendency with model photography to want to sort of three-quarter light, backlight or side light. If you just come too far forward, it can start to flatten things out too much. At the end of the day, you, you, you're chasing reality. You want something to look real. Just as important as lighting the Campbell Town is lighting the green screen background. This needs to be consistent in colour, so that later on, during the editing process, a computer can change anything that's green into a proper sky. What helps the shot look even more realistic is the addition of some well-wafted smoke. It's sort of common practice, really, to put some smoke in just to help um, sort of depth cue it, give some atmosphere, you know, it's the equivalent of... If you were on a, outside on a you know, mountain range, the, the distant mountains would be hazy and you'd get that sort of ha natural haze effect. Just before filming began, the ship was inspected with a fine tooth comb and Jose decided to swap a rope. It's not heavyweight enough. It would be, um, for a ship of this size, you'd have a much heavier gauge of rope to be anoraki about it. To begin with, filming progressed relatively quickly. The first real test came with shot number 22, where the Campbelltown drives straight into the dock gates. It was an audacious manoeuvre, emotively described by Jeremy. That's the best piece of camera I've ever done. The light is on one of my shoots. I've never done one as good as that. You know, with an absolute yeah. rain, the actual lighthouse, what actually happened, mm -hmm. knowing what I'm talking about, not trying to remember my eyes. <laughs> Brilliant. thing. Nobody was really certain if it would work and of course because of time and money they needed to get it right first time. So how hard should they push the boat? In the real event I mean they just had the engines on on full whack and just steamed straight into the gate and uh, it just did its own thing. We're not going to really take any risk I'm just going to let them drive it drive it home until it physically stops and they can't push it any further. You know, there's enough inertia. We've got uh, the best part of 28 stone behind it, so I don't think we should have too much trouble. It is a bit nerve-wracking. OK, roll cameras. Turn over. Three cameras. Fire up the smoke. So turn over. Right. That's all right. Hang on, roll, cut, cut. No. It's on fire. No, it's all right. Looks like they overdid it on the smoke. After a quick rejig and with everyone's nerves just that little bit more frayed, they were ready to go again. Speed all round. And action. It's perfect. Good. <laughs> oh, no. yeah. Bang on, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. That's what we wanted. Perfect. <laughs> Look at that. And then the smoke, yeah, the, the impetus of the smoke yeah, yeah, catches yeah, the ship yeah, up. Yeah. Good, huh? 
And so it was time for the shot, codenamed Kaboom, where the explosives hidden inside the Campbelltown detonate. Jose's team has a reputation for great pyrotechnic effects. They tested special cocktails of gunpowder to create different scale explosions. The main lifting charge is this one, which is just purely a fine black powder. That gets made up into a charge, basically a plastic bag back with PVC tape to give it some compression, and that helps get the burn going quicker. We then have naphthalene, which gives a nice sort of fireball -y type effect. I'm using uh, mothballs, which is a nice, nice red flame. Like CD8, this is. Um, it's basically a low energy detonator, um, just about capable of setting off high explosive. We're going to be using that to lift off the metal plates because they've got a lot of expansion, a lot of energy, and very physical small size. The firing box is relatively low tech. As each peg is struck, it completes the circuit and fires the explosive sequentially. It's all in the timing and requires a steady hand. It's a f***ing job, so... <clears throat> I'll probably do it myself, so if it goes wrong, it's only myself to blame. After five hours of rigging, the success of Kaboom relied on a confusing snake's nest of fuse wire. This is a one-hit wonder. So everything relies on in this one take. It's great fun working towards it, but then when you get there on the day or a couple of days lead up to the event, then obviously you're you're very um, preoccupied with what you're about to do and, you know, gone are the days where you'd be given three or four goes at getting a big shot like that right. You, these days, people just want to pay for you to do it, prep it and do it once and, you know, get it right first time, which is wrong, really, but um, that's just the way it works these days. It puts an awful lot more pressure on us to get it right. You will sense as the time goes by, the atmosphere does change. Yeah, because it's it is a culmination of a lot of people's efforts, and we do want to try and get it right in memory of the people you know that are on the actual raids. It's what we live for. It's it's great stuff. As long as it, as long as we get the shot, you know that's what we're all nervous about. I mean, if the thing ends up in in bits, as long as we got the shot, it doesn't matter. It's uh, what we built it for. Uh, yeah, sort of goodbye. Thanks for all the fish, really, isn't it? <laughs> Well, without sounding completely obvious, uh, I think this might get slightly loud. That should be big. This should be good. It was all over in a flash, and nobody would really know if the shot had worked until they examined the footage in slow motion. Cameras are cut there. Our friends across the uh, across the pond tend to uh, whoop and holler and make a bit more of a deal of it. But um, I don't know. I tend to get a bit. I tend to go quite quiet during those events because um, again, there's too much at stake. And you, you know, you spent three or four hours rigging something, and you've got one model. You know, you don't have an opportunity opportunity of doing it twice. You just it's got to be right. Very good. Very pleased with it. Relief? Yes. The end. Well, it was certainly the end of filming, but not the end of the project. The footage had to be rushed into post-production, where computer-generated effects could be added to embellish the shots. For a feature film, this amount of work would take about three months to sort out. Here, the five-man team had just three weeks. This is... Well, the, the first shot, basically, of um, the Campbelltown in Falmouth, 
Um, so it's the establishing shot, if you like, of the, um, the documentary. If I just quickly show you the final shot we have here, which is quite different. We obviously have the, the, the main model of the boat itself. That's what was shot down at the studios. Moving water that was shot on location down at uh, Weymouth. Then we have photographs of these buildings made in, making up the harbour. The cranes were separate elements. They were extracted and put on. Um, the, the rolling hillside in the background, that's um, a separate element from a photograph, as was the sky, a separate element. Then we have the moving elements, which is the bilge pumps just coming out of the, the boat there, just at the bottom, and the, the bird just popping in. So quite sort of subtle, small movements, but they just go together to make the, the shot work. That's a relatively simple shot. Some require up to 30 layers. Here, transforming a boring angle of the ship's nose into a dramatic point of view, placing the viewer slap bang in the middle of the Campbelltown under fire. The other main ingredient in the shot is the tracer fire, and we've developed specifically for this um, documentary uh, a, a plug-in for the compositing package that we use, which um, generates tracer fire. Um, you've got lots of sort of controls on it, the, the speed, the, um, the gravity as it drops off um, and the, the rebound when it hits things. A lot of sort of research was done into how Tracer actually reacted, so we've hopefully got that quite accurate. Unsurprisingly, it was the final explosion that took most work. There's still quite a lot going on uh, here in terms of layers. Uh, the engines were still running, we've added smoke coming from the engines. A lot of the buildings were still smouldering, so there's still smoke lingering around. In an ideal world, it would have been sort of three times that. And we, obviously, you, you can be a, far more aggressive and put a lot more into the recipes of the bangs and, and get even more smaller detail working for you. But, yeah, considering Considering what we were working with, I think it's, uh, I'm very happy with it. It's a good result. Although it's the dramatic fireball that dominates, the most labour-intensive part was adding in the soldiers. Look over towards us, over this way. These highly trained actors are then digitally manipulated and can be placed anywhere in the scene. That's good. The final stage is to add in sound effects. They're the finishing touch that help make the sequence as convincing as possible. Compare the mute version with the final version. I'm not asking the public to believe that's real, you know. We've built a hundred and odd foot long boat and we've gone and rebuilt the docks and done them. Or we've gone, we've built a time machine and gone back with a camera and filmed the moment. The public are too TV savvy. So, hey, people are going to work out that's a reconstruction. What I'm hoping is they'll go, yes, you've done it justice and you haven't, you haven't insulted my intelligence with what you've shown me. And... Whoa.